Hey everybody, so we are back. I am Devin Evans, relationship coach and also sex coach student in training and I'm here with Tasha Jackson and we are um, covering part two of our sessions live recap of 2019 with Esther Perel. And today we are finishing the last half of the um, summary, but we're starting out today um, talking about Ian Kerner's uh, speech about erotic conflict and fantasy and the importance that fantasy plays in um, the sexual intimate lives of couples. And um, so one of the things that he talked about was the importance of, of, of being naked with each other versus just being nude. And so he talks about how, you know, when we are, when we're, naked in front of someone that's when we're really exposing all of our vulnerabilities and in sex it's really difficult to hide ourselves um we try to often and 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 sometimes we we will go inside of our bodies and protect ourselves we'll put a guard up a wall and when we're really naked with with each other and when we we have courage to share our fantasies and talk to our partner about what we would like to explore, where our mind goes. That's when we can really get to some raw, intimate places with our partner. What do you think? Well, I actually have a question for you. Yeah. Um, for this, because I have wrote, I loved his like, definition between naked versus, or nakedness versus nudity. Mm -hmm. um, say nakedness is to be someone else's self without dis with with yourself without disguise, and then nudity is not yet to be seen oneself or on display. Condemned. Yeah. yeah. But while you were talking, I was wondering, what is your experience to having somebody push themselves to that edge? Because I hear people wanting to go there. They have the fantasies in their mind. Mm -hmm. But to express that to their partner or someone they haven't met yet or I, mm -hmm. what are your, what do you feel like somebody from one place to another? Like how to get there? Yeah. How to get to that next level? I would say first and foremost, it always starts with curiosity. I think that there are questions that can lead us down different pathways that are not the pre-formulated, what do you like in bed? Because there's there's that which is kind of superficial and it's a little bit more expected versus tell me about one of the most erotic experiences that you've ever had. Mm -hmm. What was it about the environment, the person, the the senses that you experienced that really woke you up inside and made you want to do things that you had never tried before or you know what where do you go in sex who do who do you become in sex do you do you like to lose yourself what are some verbs and descriptor words that you would that that you feel describe you during a sexual experience are you looking for surrender are you looking to are you looking for a release? Are you looking for a, a, to transport yourself somewhere? Are you looking to try out different erotic personas? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that if you can go a little bit deeper, and I, I believe Esther has um, a list of some really good erotic questions, and maybe we could put a few of those sampler erotic questions up on the, the summary page on, on your YouTube channel. Um, but I would say it starts with with curiosity and wanting to know about about what what is it that what is it about sex that creates meaning for someone and what does what is the role of sex for someone is it something that you are does it feel more obligatory does it feel like it's 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 like a central part of your identity. Does it feel like a peripheral part of your identity? Um, and I would say, is there is there a fantasy that you replay that you find yourself replaying in your head when you are making love, or when you're touching yourself, or when you're pleasuring yourself? Some of those questions can be a little bit personal to people mm -hmm. who have never really gone there. Yeah. Um, so I would start with something that is less sounds less sexual and sounds maybe a little bit more 
like who you are because that can be a little bit less threatening, but it actually gives you a lot more information. Yeah, I noticed some of those questions, which are so great, were a little bit more specific. So mm -hmm. it wasn't this big grandeur thing, just a little something and nudging in, and I could see how that just opens the door. Mm -hmm. And also some of them are assuming, which I like sometimes to ask the question, like, okay, I'm assuming you have a fantasy, versus like, oh, do you have a fantasy? It's like, yes. okay, like, you're going to tell me about this. And I yes. like that. There's, yes. like, that puts down the defenses and puts you in. There's just different ways of asking questions. So yes. I appreciate that manner. Yes. And I have to say, I was coming back to the line of like the booty Rorschach test. That's my line. What? What is that? Booty, the booty Rorschach, Rorschach test. That's oh, what I, I don't know about it. That's like one of the chapters in my book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like what? Like, what is sex to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's the, you know, just so thinking about it. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Getting back to his stuff, which I love this part. I've never thought of sex in three categories. You have the procreate, the relational, and the recreational. And then the idea that to fuse those last two and then with a re-relational, I don't know how he said to her, Rec relational <laughs> is what you described it as. Which is fantastic, right? Yeah. Because yeah. we all focus on the recreational because that's fun to think about. What's the, you know, what's the, out, the outliers in our society or what's the interesting level. But also there's that, like, this, there's just the relational, like that connecting. And mm -hmm. I love that idea of combining it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it is important to talk about the procreative sex because that is usually a particular chapter in a couple's like lifespan is that time when maybe they're wanting to have a baby. And that's a very different type of sex. If we, for anybody out there who has ever had that or has tried to have a baby, it is very, it's usually very um, strategic, very, very intentional, very methodical. And, and you know, you're keeping a calendar. Like it's, there is a specific outcome you want from that type of sex versus the relational, which is about, it's more about like the love making and it's about staying connected to your partner. And like you said, the recreational, which is like, what are some taboos that we want to play with? Like, <laughs> do we want to just like go have sex in the bathroom while we're, you know, uh, on this date or whatever. Um, and, and so to merge those two where you're, you're, you're exploring your fantasies together and you, you do feel more connected afterwards. So it, it's a very intimate, but you're doing this very intimate act in, in kind of a taboo risque kind of a way. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's very powerful sex. Yeah. You know, it's interesting now, just when you're speaking, I was thinking, you know, gynecologists probably would like you to be more relaxed when having procreational sex and probably wouldn't mind if you're combining the other two. Mm -hmm. Because people are so anxious and so, and that's not exactly helping the body to be, you know, for, you know, getting pregnant in a stressed castle. Mm -hmm. So my guess is a gynecologist would tell you to try to mix it with the other two. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I am so not a doctor to be giving unsolicited <laughs> advice like this, but that's like why, you know, it's to have these three lists of them, but like yeah. we should just mix them all up. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to procreate all the time, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Um, do you know the other part that I, there's this part that I can't wait for the books to read is the um, different fantasy realms of side to side and face to face fantasy books that he recommended. And okay, this is where I feel really naive that I have to tap your brain. <laughs> I feel stupid, but I don't mind um, curiosity, right? Um, so can you explain to me the face-to-face -face versus the side-by-side -side in sexual fantasy? So the face-to-face -face is you could be sharing a, a fantasy over like dinner conversation or drinks, or it could be you are literally in the act engaging sexually and you could be acting it out as you're doing it or the side by side could be reading erotica together or listening, reading or listening to erotica together. It could be watching a movie together that's erotic. So, and it could be watching porn together where you're, you're both, your attention is on a third 
party or a, an object or a thing outside of you, but you're, you're both doing it together and you might be having totally different experiences, which could then be used actually to do a face-to-face -face simulation afterward okay. where you're talking about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete yeah. sense, and you yeah. clarified that completely for me. Yeah. I've never had it on board, and you yeah. just you just made that clear. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am strong enough to admit that I did not know what that was. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it comes back to. Um, anyways, I also thought it was fascinating about the female brain. This is where I can nerd out that the female brain sh needs to shut off the anxiety part in order to have the orgasm. So, yeah. I mean, that is amazing. Like, yeah. ha talk about a sort of anti-anxiety medicine. Go have yes. sex. Yes, yes. And so, I don't know if you've read Emily Nagoski's book, Come As You Are, but she talks about how there's the accelerator and then there are the brakes. And so, the accelerator is your, your natural inclination to have an interest in sex and how interested are you? It's, you know, if, if you look at it on a scale versus the breaks, which are all of those inhibitors like the anxiety, like depression, like your body self image, like your, if you're worried about STIs or getting pregnant or your reputation. So there, there are um, a, a whole plateful of breaks, but the ones that we, a lot of times don't talk about are the breaks for men that they do share a lot of those things, which is what happens when they experience erectile disappointment. Yeah. And the, I like that framing. Yeah. It was, uh, I forget who, who, who started talking about it that, that way, but I, I like that as well because it's a disappointment to, to the man instead of a, you know, pathologizing it. But, um, but yeah, so she might have like a high, high sexual interest, high accelerator, but if she has way too many breaks on, then it doesn't matter how high her accelerator is. So if, if she can turn off the anxiety in her head, which is, I mean, Emily Nagoski gives a lot of ideas on how to do that. And she's got a workbook for it as well. Then, then she can experience like substantially more pleasure than she's got all those breaks going on in her head. And one of those stressors that I mean, I hear in my office a lot is like, I really don't, you know, that partner has violated something with me you know, yes. emotionally hurt me, you know, or, you know, physically. And it's like your brain is protecting themselves. The body is in that protection. And so the breaks are, you know, really high with that person in particular. And then it's interesting for them to just take that, am I now not sexual? Mm -hmm. am, you know, then they build this script around it where mm -hmm. it could be person specific. I don't know. So mm -hmm. um, I have seen her TED Talks. I think she's amazing. I think if yeah. anybody is wanting to know how they can increase their sexual desire it's like go there first mm -hmm. and she's just, just great wealth of information yes um i'm gonna keep us moving mm -hmm. so um speaking of erotic blocks i think it would be a nice switch over to if it's guy winch on mm -hmm. heartbreak yes i thought what he did was brilliant it's much better than i would ever come up with um but he talks about how do we love again and how do we become that erotic self mm -hmm. after we've had that heartache and talk about protection mode. Mm -hmm. um, I love how he starts out. The first thing is just validate that your brain and your body is going to make you appear, you know, quote crazy. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do things that you would never think you would do. And um, yeah, I mean, just hearing that is like, yeah, we've all done that, you yeah. know? Even if it's just a slight, like, I'm going to stalk them on social media. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the biggest takeaway for me was that confirmation that when you're trying to get over someone, you need to go cold turkey. You can't do this whole weaning off or just a little bit or what if I just look at them from, from afar on social media or what if I'm still connected to their brother or their sister or their best friend? It's like cut off all ties and even if that means that if your connections are so deep, then go off social media for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I, I tell my clients, I'm like, there's a part where, yeah, you are losing that relationship, but you're also losing so many things that come with the relationship. So the family, these connections, and it's okay to mourn all these other ripple effects that happen. 
because it's a bummer. You may really like their family. Yeah. Um, but then this is the time for healthy boundaries. Yes. It's hard to take. Can you talk about what are the questions that a person should be asking themselves about what they want to take with them from that and mm -hmm. moving forward? What parts do they want to keep? Oh, <clears throat> so when you part of like now that their relationship's done, like how do you move forward? Mm -hmm. I think identity changes a lot. You mm -hmm. know, when we're with somebody, we bring ourselves and they bring themselves and we merge, we influence each other. And we're also going through a different phase of life. When you get to somebody, you may be 22, and then when you leave, maybe you're 29 in a different phase of life. So your identity would have changed anyways, but you've been influenced with them. So I think it's a nice time to pause and say, okay, like, where do I want to be from here? What do I want to take? What do I want to renew differently? I also think there's things that I call metaphorical gifts, something that will leave from somebody that we can say, oh, God, I wish I would have never loved them. Like, mm, what is that gift that you are left with? Mm -hmm. It would be big as, like, having a child or the gift of, like, hey, they pushed me to take my career seriously or they showed me, they healed me an old wound that I'm worth having a voice. Um, and, or even if it was really abusive, like, okay, this is not the way to be treated and I'll never let this happen. Um, and I think taking that time to pause in these moments and allow us not to repeat patterns again. Mm -hmm. And that's a crucial part. Like, are we learning in our journey? Um, because we can have so much shame afterwards, like, oh, wasted time, oh, divorce. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, it's a journey. So. What do you say to someone who keeps asking themselves the same questions over and over again? It's like literally like a loop in their head. It's a tape that keeps playing. And I know you experience this with your clients that they keep asking themselves, well, was it me? Was it more me? What did I do that caused this? And it's like no matter how many times you tell them or, or you talk about it, and it seems like they feel some resolution, they just continue to ask the same questions over and over again. How do you break the loop? Hmm, that's a really great question. Um, it's, you know, obviously individual, but I remember when a kid is learning something and it takes so many times to, to really get in there and we're no different. And sometimes we're stuck and there's a moment of pausing that can be the deepest growth. What is that that we're here sitting with? And then for me as a practitioner, I'm like, trying to go with all the different angles. Okay, what question am I not asking? I'm holding a little responsibility. And for them, I mean, I could go over and over, and then it's somebody else asking the same question out in the real world, and they're like, aha! I know. <laughs> Which is fine, as long as it gets them to that place. Um, it's a really good question, um, but I think it's a lot of patience and holding, and sometimes we're in a and it's replaying something from our past, and trauma can have us frozen. And so it may not be about that relationship, but it may be about that frozen state that we're used to. And it can be an, op you know, an opening to go back to that trauma to get them to move. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, for me, I would say as, as a coach, so, like I would give them a punctuation mark. Mm -hmm. I would, it, 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 in the form of like a, a mantra, um, and something very definitive and it might not explain everything, but it's a good like punctuation mark to end this, the like repeated thought loop with like, um, it could be, um, and sometimes it can be, it, it can sound a little nasty, but when you're still trying to get over that person, I think that can be useful. Mm -hmm. So it could be, well, maybe because he, she, was a dirt bag or was a, was a little, and I'm, so I like to use explicit language because I think it gives a little more oomph, uh -huh. but I would say like, well, because he was a fuckhead or something like that. Like, because sometimes when, when you haven't really, like, I think it takes a certain amount of emotional growth and maturity to really be able to sort through what actually happened. And if you're not to the point where you're, you can claim responsibility over it because you're still like bewildered as to what the hell happened then you need like a punctuation mark to be like, well, because he was a fuckhead, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then like, you just keep telling yourself that, well, because he was a fuckhead. 
And then, <laughs> and then once you're to the point where you've done some growth, like you've read some books, you've done maybe more coaching therapy, then you can start to like sort through the good parts where it's like, ah, okay. It's really a lot of that was caused because I was premeditating this. I was, I was almost like, scripting the relationship to be to to have this particular outcome I really hadn't healed from this yet and so because I hadn't healed then that was the reaction to it and you can really gain the wisdom out of the aftermath part of that but I think sometimes that little loop needs like a little oomph to it I know I like that I like it a lot <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I mean just as speaking to you kind of spawned you know another thing that I do is like looking taking the content out and looking at the process of what that person does in those hard moments yeah so your example them berating themselves mm -hmm. so when there's conflict they take the blame themselves yeah are they externalizing it or are they internalizing yeah. it and then what is that pattern? Where did it come from? And just putting that in the room. Like, I'm noticing that you're taking all this. Yeah. And, um, that growth that they've done research on doing it on relationships. And women tend to do more self-blame that they are the problem at the core versus men tend to do a little bit more of it was bad chemistry, it was bad timing. So that kind of pushes off the blame toward them as a person as being a defect mm -hmm. um, and I just give them a little psycho education of that too and it's mm -hmm. super interesting how a woman will like oh yeah I think I'm at the core horrible um, yeah. but that sort of switches too where sometimes psycho education doesn't do a whole lot but that I don't know I feel like that feeds them I know and sometimes I have to like try out some different techniques to see what seems like it's resonating with them mm-hmm I have to like, cause sometimes that educational piece is like, woo, went right over their head. Like it did, they didn't ingest any of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> it maybe wasn't what they needed, you know, it's yeah. like so tough or they weren't ready for it and they need to hear it 10 more times. Yeah. So it's true. So true right? It's where we are healing arts <laughs> as science. <laughs> okay. We have so much to go through. I'm going to keep this going. Uh, but I like this part. Like people cannot be friends with their partners until mm -hmm. they're, until you're completely over them. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I always think of Sarah McLaughlin's video of like watching a puppy. I'm like, you know, like you're drawn in with just that one image. What do you think about seeing an X online? Of course you can have all these things in just like 30 seconds. Yes. You know, so it's like our brains are programmed to like those images are powerful. Yes. yes. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Then we're on to erotica. <laughs> um, this part of, I have notes of lack of desire, your body desires, your brain doesn't understand a thing, and it only works on pleasure and pain. The body will try and protect you. Um, I think the erotic voice, um, and looking at how we've been marginalized. So some of us being marginalized, saying that maybe we come from women who haven't always had their voice, and how does that affect us when we've been traumatized sexually, and looking at that um, aspect of how that silences our erotic mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think that comes into the the legacy of like what what are the legacies that we're carrying with us? Is it and does it have to do with our demographics? Are we are we a person of color that's carrying around? social trauma and sexual trauma, um, um, you know, economic um, disadvantages. And, and of course that affects our sexual self. Absolutely. All of those things are breaks and, and it's like the body keeps score. The body remembers that stuff. And, and so it's like, that is, those are survival tactics to, keep us vigilant and on guard so that we're constantly looking out for our subconscious is looking out for danger. And when we, when we have to be in a, a vigilant mindset where we're constantly scanning our environments for threats, then, you know, it, it can take some, this is the interesting part. I don't know if you've ever read Michael Bader's book, the secret logic of sexual fantasies arousal. Um, that book is really interesting. And it does talk about the pathogenic beliefs that we 
develop in childhood where um, in order to become aroused, we have to, we, our, our psyches create a way for us to overcome the, the barrier, the obstacle, the belief, the bad belief that we have about ourselves in order to become aroused. So that very thing, whether it's, okay, let's say it's rejection, for example, and maybe you felt highly rejected in your childhood. And so one of the ways that you can become sexually aroused is by, this is just one example, fantasizing about having multiple partners. Because it's very desired. Because, yeah, you're basically inoculated from rejection because you have multiple people there who are, who are like, subconsciously building your self-esteem that you're high, you're that desirable that multiple people want you. And if one of them rejects you, then you've got an abundance of other pursuers who can counteract that feeling of rejection. So it's interesting how our, our fantasies can soothe our psyches in a way. And, and it, it's like they really restore a, an imbalance that we, that we might feel about ourselves. And a lot of that stuff doesn't change as we get older. Like those same themes that we have in our sexual fantasies stay the same. Um, you can develop new ones, but but all of those those breaks and everything need some kind of a way to, it needs to either be relieved or like a bridge to cross over through like a sexual fantasy. And I like how the accelerator and they talked about the different senses, playing with the different senses. Yeah. It's like we, we are often aware or unaware of some of those breaks. I'm like, okay, but how do I change it? You know, that's often yeah. like, okay, how do I make a difference to move forward? Yeah. And can't change the fact that I have kids or this yeah. or the stress of like, oh, you can, but you know, like what, what kind of push me this way? So I love just some of those practical ideas of like okay, breaking it down to the senses. And you talked about that earlier today. Yeah. Um, pushing forward again, my mm -hmm. taskmaster here. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I love this line, and I have to read it, even though it's sort of non-succinct, but catching the lies we tell ourselves. Mm. Yeah, that's a big one. That's, that's, that can be like a lifetime of work. Yes. Yeah. And denying things are important for you or just putting yourself, you know, all, you can frame this in so many different ways, mm -hmm. but I thought it was powerful. Yeah. Um, and then getting back to the erotic, this is another line that stuck with me. The erotic mind is not politically correct. Yeah. And I wonder how much that plays into wanting to tell that to your partner. You know, absolutely. <laughs> A huge part of that. Of like, oh, are you going to judge me? Yeah. Um, and that's why a lot of people will outsource their true erotic interests whether it be through paid sex workers or erotic massages or, you know, infidelity, because it's easier to go to someone who will accept you. You don't really have any real ties to them. It's anonymous. And you can, you have a safe space there where you're, where they're not going to judge you and you don't have to deal with the fallout of sharing that. Even if it's just a fantasy and you don't want to act it out. Yeah. It's a lot at stake. Yeah. Huh. I appreciate that. Uh, it's, Huh, it's I haven't thought about. All right, so we promised in our part one that we'd dive into porn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we dive into porn. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, we had our speaker who, forgive me, I think you have the name of him, but he started to talk about the uh, sort of the different, his opinion, straight porn was hard for him to say was okay as far as um, validate it. Hard to defend were his words versus gay porn, um, where he felt that was more defendable. Um, my biggest takeaway from him that I thought was just tremendous was the value of porn being validating, mm -hmm. that someone can go in and watch porn and say, I'm okay, because this is a fantasy being played out. And I hadn't thought of it in that term. Yeah, yeah, it was Don Chewy and, 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 he was ta he was talking about how you know these these marginalized going back to marginalized people that have specific orientations or erotic fixations or erotic orientations they might present as straight but maybe they have they have homosexual erotic orientations where they might 
want to fantasize. They might be in a straight relationship, but they're fantasizing about being with other men. And that going to porn and being able to find your happy place there, your erotic happy place there, is extremely validating because you don't have to check in with anyone. You don't have to get permission from anyone. You don't have to check and see if they're going to feel rejected. They're going to be, ha the person on the screen is always going to be happy. They're always going to be receiving pleasure. You don't have to worry about rejection. You don't have to worry about performance anxiety. And, and they're always going to be there for you. You can, you can log in anytime and it's, there it is. Yes. And, and you, like, you don't have to worry about any social fallout. And so, and, and it's a private space. And, and, you know, I didn't used to understand why porn was so private. Like, why was it such a taboo thing to find out about your partner's porn habits? And it, that is exactly why. They don't want you going on. That's why there's the, 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 the incognito browser on Google Chrome. Like, you can go incognito and it doesn't store any of your browsing history. And nobody will ever know what you searched for. And, and it's like, that, that stuff is highly personal. And you can find like anything and everything out there, which is good and it can be bad. It can have consequences um, because we know that child pornography is one of the most widely consumed types of porn out there, which is incredibly scary. So, so, so that's the other part of it. Is it's, it's it's complex. It's not just like carte blanche. Okay, we can watch whatever kind of porn we want. Well, what if we're talking about a kind of porn where we're, we're like, we are brutally massacring some, anyone, anyone. And what if we're talking about a real rape scene? What if we're talking about um, a type of porn where the, the actors and the performers are not given a heads up about what's coming in the scene? It's a complete shock to them. And there's, there's not these boundaries discussed, people are being used and degraded. Um, and even within that, if you do have performers who are, who, who know kind of what the scene is going to be about, it's going to be about degradation, violence, all of that stuff. I mean, that's still a real person's body that's being used. And even though they are willingly going into that, obviously there are consequences to that. And a lot of performers have experienced having to go to the emergency room for all kinds of terrors, hernias, like, I mean, hemorrhaging, all kinds of things. So it's not just, it's not just fantasy. Like these are real people's bodies. And that's the side that people get really tense about. Um, but there are ethical porn sites like Erica Lest is one. There are some other ones. I'll have to find them in my resources that they, that they do legitimately pay the, the performers and the actors. Everybody gets screened for STDs and, and people talk about the scenes beforehand. So there's consent discussed, boundaries discussed. Um, and so I would encourage that kind of porn more than some of the stuff that isn't as regulated and it's sort of yeah. questionable. Yeah, well, definitely when there's human rights yeah. and abuse and, um, I mean, it, it's crazy with me with the entertainment industry because I got done with the graduate school right when um, these shows that were more, what are they called, reality TV shows were starting. And you couldn't do a psych experiment like Big Brother. That would be considered unethical. So there are, and but it's okay for entertainment. So then you take it to the next level, porn. Like there's no way any psych experiment could be that because it's unethical because what's the emotional damage? What's the physical damage? So but to me, it's just fascinating of like that somehow is acceptable as entertainment. But, you know, if we really looked at it, what is, we write off emotional damage and obviously there's physical yeah. damage. So. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and I was going to say, you know, if, if we're talking about too, like the exploration of it, the, the positive sides of it, when when you're looking to explore something and it's a particular kink or a fantasy that you want to try out with your partner, porn can be a great place to generate ideas. It can be a great place to generate um, like positions or or like a, a power dynamic. Um, it can be a great idea to figure out, oh, what's what are some examples of dirty talk? Like, um, 
you know, like I was going to say name calling, but it's in the best possible way of that. Um, and so I think it's, it's a great place to, to explore a creative or creativity in an erotic space. And even when, you know, if you look at Erica Lust stuff, she gives these educational videos before or after some of her real porn videos. And she'll sit and talk with the actors and interview them about how did they get to be the kind of performer that they are, if they're a dominatrix or if they're a sub, if there's a feminist who is interested in being a submissive, she's having internal conflict with herself. Like, why am I fantasizing about this? What is it about me? And, and trying to reconcile her erotic preferences with her political views. And so going to a source that, that pays their actors well, or that is ethical and responsible about it, then you know you're supporting something that is putting, put, putting something good out into the world. Because they also talk about sex ed for kids and how do you talk to your kids about porn because you're inevitably inevitably going to stumble across that, at least by the time you're five or six, uh, if you're a parent, your kid is. So really? I think, yeah. Really? Yeah. Crazy. Super, super quick. So Erica Lust started um, a, like a separate page all about <laughs> parent resources. Wow. Okay. How and when to talk to your kids about porn, how to how to help them to know that this is fantasy and that's its purpose is fantasy, but also being responsible about your consumption because that's the key. Yeah. You don't have to just like, I mean, it doesn't have to be condemned and it shouldn't be condemned. Yeah. It's tricky because you think of it, you know, like it's easy with regular entertainment. You've got a cartoon, that's fantasy. You know, you got somebody dressed up in this outfit, but not all porn is somebody in a fuzzy, you know, some is, but like, yeah. like that would help with differentiating and just that, you know, the curiosity, what do people do in bed? Um, but she sounds fantastic that she's also making it educational at the same time. Like, hey, let's play and then let's talk. Um, I love that. Ooh. All right, so I'm going to keep this moving. Um, all right, learning to be vulnerable versus contempt. Um, the power of the depressed. I know that's like a tough way of the weakness you feel. Um, moving on, I'm going to talk about not so, this statistic kind of made sense to me, but I hadn't heard it before. 60% of the people who are lonely are partnered. Yes. <laughs> that doesn't sound, sound shocking to me, but yeah. 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 And I think we forget that. It's like, oh, they have somebody. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's almost like we need to know that when somebody enters the room, they're probably lonely. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it can make it more painful because there's that expectation. Well, because I'm in a partnership, I should be able to, I should be able to have these needs met from you, but I'm not. And so it can make it more painful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even more so. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of talk about the trauma of PTSD and hypoarousal um, being so similar that it's the avoidance comes from, I, I just see if I'm articulating this well. I never thought of PTSD and the hypoarousal of sex getting confused. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was like, oh, huh. That, I could see how that could play out in erotic of like, uh, that's confusing for somebody. Is this trauma coming in or is this me getting aroused? Um, if I'm remembering this correctly. Yeah. And there are some therapists, some sex therapists who say that, that the trauma reenactment can be done or there can be healing from trauma through sex play like sexual fantasies sexual reenacting that stuff in a in a safe environment where where you can you're reliving your trauma but in a way where you have full agency and full autonomy to re-experience it all over again and so you're healing the trauma that was done in the first place by now you have agency over yourself and you have complete freedom to choose this all over again when that thing was sexualized for you 
and and that 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 experience of of having your freedom and your power taken away from you. So it's interesting, and it, it doesn't always work from what I've heard from sex ther- certain sex therapists, but it can be a very full, very powerful way to heal from that. Mm-hmm. I can see that working. It's not only desensitizing, but it's giving them a new script. It's you know by learning from it. Um, I would I wouldn't say it desensitizes the sexual charge because that's actually a lot for a lot of people. You've probably heard about this as well that that those moments when someone was abused sexually, they are some of the most, if not the most, sexually charged like fantasy or mini fantasy context for a person for that person and and for lots of different reasons that we don't need to go into here but it does allow them to put it into a whole different context and and then they can they don't have to have that internal conflict where they're like why do i need why do i keep sexualizing this but it it sort of it soothes their mind soothes their mind yeah it's really interesting no, I was I'm glad you corrected me on that because I, I think my meaning was more of like pushing that to healing, to moving healing, that, yeah. yeah, moving that because it, when we, I think for anybody listening to this, all this stuff takes time. Yes. You know, we can sit here and say, do this and this, this, or think this way. But if there's been trauma in this, any realm, it is patience and time yeah. and to go at your own pace. Yeah. And you may want to be there you know, tomorrow, but it may take years. Yeah. Great and been, point. Yeah. And it's been sitting with somebody for years. And like one of the speakers said, it can take 10 years for most people to come in yeah. after a trauma, a sexual yeah. trauma. And I'm like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. If ever. You know, so yeah. many people just hold it for a lifetime. True. Um, True. So as we're wrapping up from some my notes, my notes come to an end. Um, what are some of the things that you want to hold on to from the whole searching for your own? Because mm-hmm. I'll say the imagination, the, yes. the erotic, was not one of my biggest takeaways because yes. I just forgotten that, you know, I can, most, we could come to an orgasm just in our head and the power yeah. of that. Yes, absolutely. That, that is so true. And I, I think even in, even in, in relationships that are open or that are more sexually liberated, even in those relationships, people can think that they they're they have a pretty expansive sexual vocabulary vocabulary like being positions and like sex toys and and all of this stuff. But that's that's a much more literal sense of what. That's that's not really even erotic. Eroticism is what you just described. It's that imagination, and it's continuing to explore and continuing to to read erotica or to like ask people about what their fantasies are or what is it that turns them on or context. And and so f- for me, I like to to absorb all of that stuff because it just it opens my eyes to how wide and diverse human sexuality is, and that. If you can think of it, someone is turned on by it. Any, any, that. any bodily function, someone is turned on by it. Any context, any body part, it could be your nose, it could be your toes, it doesn't matter. Someone finds that erotic, and and so I think that's the beauty of eroticism is that it you will never tap it out. It will never reach its full potential. All right, so I have a random. I love what you just said, by the way. But I have this random thought. It's, not congruent at all to our conversation <laughs> but like I was thinking of somebody who has imagination like I don't believe everybody I think we have neurodiversity in our brains yeah and just to be honest like every brain is different some of yeah. us are more open to the elasticity for creativity than others yeah so then if we are doing imagination and creativity are tied to the erotic what if somebody doesn't feel that they are that creative yeah Do they feel I would like to know the reason between if somebody doesn't feel they're creative do they feel that they have a lower erotic like experience so I don't know if there's any research on that but that just fascinated me I'm like if somebody feels that they're more this way does that impede their eroticism I don't know I think those are all great words you said and and a great question I don't know what the research is out there but from what I've 
seen and experienced, I think it does. I think they do usually go together. And you bring up a great point because people who are le- have a less are, are basically less verbal and maybe a little bit more physical or maybe more analytical have maybe more of that left brain. From what I've seen, it can be difficult to tap into eroticism, but it goes back to the whole point of the conference, which was that it, it is, we should be expanding that idea more than just beyond just sexuality. It's, It's what brings you to life. What are your hobbies? And can, can you look at your hobbies or these, these things that you like to do that bring you to life and find something within that, that could be used to enhance your sexual eroticism. Mm. I like that. Cause I think I have it all in a little box. Yeah. That, that you can use different parallels from different situations and, and bring it in to a sexual space and, and play with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't know, just, just yes. a thought, but I, I think yeah. you're right. It seems like too, like, and I'm just spawning on to like our summaries here and what you've been saying and thinking of the themes. It feels like there's this big part of validating what we're thinking. Yeah. Connecting with somebody else is yeah. often this all happens in our own heads, whether it be mm-hmm. trauma or, the desire or whatever it is, it's like, okay, take that that courage to open up to somebody else. Like that part of it just sort of like inkling. Just connect. Yeah. connect. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's another one I don't mention last time we talked that really struck with me and it was the assumption and I think it was on the level talking about porn, but thinking that if somebody's walking into the room, if they're a woman you're, we should almost assume they've had sexual trauma. Yeah, because the minority of women is that they haven't. Mm-hmm. They're the minority. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. And then if somebody is LGBTQ, that they haven't been feeling that they are accepted. Yeah. You know, there's just those parts of like, okay, let's just flip those statistics and assume when someone comes in that this has been their experience versus that, again, that questioning that doesn't lead to the the validation. Yeah. And I think that's a different way of approaching something. Yes, absolutely. Very much so. Oh, I was, I was, what I was going to say earlier was that, um, you know, a lot of going back to sexual desires and sexual fantasies, that a lot of times people will have resentment toward their partner that they haven't been able to explore something or do something or that their partner has been holding them back sexually. But a lot of times that wish has been, it's been a dialogue that's been going on in the person's head with their partner. It's like a made up imagined dialogue of, well, if I, if I say this and I tell that person what I really want to do, then they're going to reject me. They're going to say, no, they're going to da 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 da. And it's like, have you ever tried and how much have you tried? Have you tried to, and if you did try it, you approach the topic and you were shut down, you were rejected. Did you ever try again to bring it up in a different context at a different point in time? Or was it just that one time and you just assumed that it had stayed that it has stayed that way? Because we make these assumptions about our partners that if we ask them one time in our relationship, are you interested in X, Y, Z? And this goes beyond sex. We just think that they're like frozen in time and that they never change their mind and they never grow out of that and they never want to do that. And that is so not true. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, and I, I'm going to feed off that. I think it's also the person needs to hold accountable of like, okay, so they opened up to me. Yeah. I acknowledge that. Can we bring this up another time? Yeah. So it's keeping that safety, constantly yeah. the safety of like, I'm so happy that you brought this up. I'm not open to this now, but let, let me initiate next time something to back so oh, it's I like that uh, yeah so it holds it back even with the conversation of a fight like I can't talk about this now but I'm going to take the responsibility because I'm shutting you down to come back in 24 hours to bring this back up yeah so you know like whatever that. it is yeah so it's a dance because I mean I I about with your work but I constantly see one person getting tired and burn out and then they just shut down yeah and then the other person's like well where are you I'm like yeah. I've given up and like, yeah 
bring them back. Yeah, so. exactly. That that answer of maybe not right now, but that doesn't mean it's forever. But it's difficult to get to that point yourself or to get your partner to that perspective mm -hmm. to be open enough. That's the hard part, like you just said, where you've got one person who is a little bit more flexible and the other person who's just clinging on for dear life to not not changing and not mm. they want the stability they don't want to change all right so i have a bizarre question before. i know we should probably wrap up but so in, in a open relationship do you feel that another person in there can kind of push that person as a benefit yes like, absolutely huh. that's fascinating yeah huh. does it threaten them though too i mean i could see it working both ways sometimes yeah, yeah. it can be threatening because because when you have multiple partners at different times, you know, you come along with different partners. Um, one person, the other, the outside party can challenge and push you to doing something. And when that idea is shared between the couple, then you're both forced to acknowledge an idea that maybe you hadn't you hadn't thought of or you hadn't been comfortable dealing with, but now because this other person wants to try that and, and it sparked some interest in one of in the, the other person, that person in the couple wants to try that. And so it's there that the outside person is like a catalyst. And so they, they, they need, they need to have that response of, well, maybe not right now, but that doesn't mean forever or yeah, let's try that. Mm. So, I like that. Yeah. You, get, you know, it's like, okay, how do we push that way? And like, sometimes we need someone else, you know, to help us, whatever it is, like therapist yeah. or, you know, yeah. partner outside, you know, just, yeah, we need people. Yes. Um, I, I also, and, the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and like in a monogamous relationship, it could just be a girlfriend or a guy friend sharing something that they're trying in their sex life. And that's why it's so important to just be able to have friends monogamous or not monogamous that you can talk about what's going on in your sexual life. Like, are you trying some different things out and hearing someone, a friend of yours that you know, and you trust, and it seems like they have their head screwed on straight, trying something that, that you're like, Oh, okay. Well, Hey, Emily, the other day was talking about doing such and such. Well, what if we try that? And then, <laughs> so it doesn't always have to be another lover, but, but just having a, a, a network of people, which is really tough to do. Yeah. Having a network of socially, like sexually open-minded people. Or just a community in general, even if yeah. it's not about the bedroom. Um, did you ever read that New York times piece that was the 21 questions? Mm -hmm. What, um, it was viral maybe about three or four, three or four years ago mm -hmm. and it was this idea if you ask these 21 questions would it make somebody fall in love with you yeah. <laughs> and you know and it people just started it was made from a lab experiment a psych lab experiment of how quickly can you get these people to bond in order to conduct this mm -hmm. experiment but then people read this article and started asking their partners these 21 questions so it spurred on a whole nother movement of like, okay, can these things, what gets us closer? What really does bond us with questions? What can increase that closeness? Mm -hmm. And I, and then I asked for it because I was fascinated by this. Um, an NPR on it said that when you're retelling, sometimes being with another couple and you're retelling a story that maybe your partner's heard a million times, but that other couple then asking a question or being intrigued will actually gain that closeness, closeness between you and your partner because they're seen in a different light or they're asking a question or whatever it is. So that community part, I think, is subtle but powerful and we forget about it, um, but we need each other. Yeah, most definitely. Yes, I agree. Well, this is good. Do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, the only thing I can think about that is just sort of my own personal rant that I kind of see, not rant, but a bit that I saw throughout was what is the Eastern thinking of didactics. You know, there's two sides mm -hmm. to everything. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I saw that throughout the whole conference mm -hmm. of, okay, so there's two sides to, to 
it's a perfect example. Like, okay, it's, everything isn't so evil. Um, and to hold that part, and even when she opened up about research, like here's our research, but here we are creative. And here's the bodily experience, and here's our intellectual. So I just feel like if there's one thing also for me to take away. We have, it's, it's nuanced. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and, and sometimes that can be difficult to communicate over like social media is that like the complexities of all these different topics because people are so, so charged these days and they're like ready to the call out culture. Mm -hmm. the call yeah. culture so it can be difficult to to talk about these things over social media in these brief little you know twitter like captions when we need to have more dialogues like this mm -hmm. where we can have the back and forth and talk about these things and go down little rabbit holes and see what's there and talk about yep. all of that stuff yeah. yeah so good point very good point but, i think it's a good point for us to end on <laughs> yeah good <laughs>